Welcome, and thanks for joining us at the Grown Ups Table. I'm Dave Patterson. And I'm Dylan DeQuano. This is the podcast where we talk to you about the shit you never learned, but you probably should have. What's going on, Dave? Oh, you know, usual loving the weather, hating the rain, though. Trying to enjoy this warmer weather, but every time I try, it seems to start raining again. (laughs) Yeah, in spring. Welcome to Canada. So, uh... Yeah. So what's on tap for today's show, Dylan? On tap? Like, what are we drinking? I mean, what are we talking about? Oh, okay. We'll get to what we're drinking once our... uh, Yeah, we'll wait for Jeff to get here. I know. Apparently, Dylan needs a beer. Yeah. (laughs) That's the only way I... uh, I'm able to hold conversation with anyone for more than three minutes is need to have some sort of alcohol. I'm kidding. I'm not an alcoholic, but you never know these days. Thank you, COVID. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Today we have a good friend of mine from back in the day, Jeff Richards. He is a chef and he... He's going to tell us exactly how he's a chef, but I know he was working at Holt Renfrew. He had his own smoking um, barbecue business. Um, He's been on TV, on CTV, talking about cooking on the social and on other things. And um, he he knows what he's doing when it comes to cooking. He's pretty qualified. Yeah. Um, The way I know Jeff is back in the day uh, when I was growing up, we used to play in some bands together back in our hometown, Georgetown. Town. Uh, he was in this great band called Thunderhawks, and he's a great singer as well, um, on top of being a great chef. I actually can't even attest to his chefliness. I've never had anything cooked by him. So Is that a word? Mm, yes. Did we make up a word? No. It's a real word. It's a real uh, that word? That is in all de- dictionaries. Chefliness. All Chefliness. Right. Look it up. Oxford. <laughs> Webster. Come at me. <laughs> <laughs> So what you been working on this week? What have I been working on? Yesterday I did the first lawn cut of the season. Oh, that's a yeah. Big deal. We just moved into our house uh, in August last year, and when we looked at the house and put in our offer and everything in July, everything looked great. The lawn looked su- superior. It looked like it'd been well maintained, manicured, taken care of. When we show up end of August, it was brown and dead and burnt so i wasn't sure how well it was going to come back but it has come back i've laid down a couple uh overseed coats a little bit the rain has helped a bit so it's coming in but yeah first one of the season want to let it kind of grow out a bit yeah for sure was the place vacant when you got it yes so as soon as they accepted an offer, they stopped watering the yes, lawn, probably. 100%. <laughs> That's what the neighbors said. The neighbors, like the day we moved in, were like, so you're going to cut that lawn? We're like, we just moved in. Like, <laughs> like, I've already cut it once for you. I'm like, well, not for me, because I didn't live here at the time. But like, obviously, it was an eyesore of the whole street. <laughs> yeah. we weren't. They weren't the only people who asked. So... I'm not, I've never been a huge lawn maintenance guy. I don't really give a crap because um, from what I've read, having weeds in your lawn is good for the environment. It's better for bees and stuff like that and pollinators and stuff like that. Realistically, having a, a wild lawn is the best thing you can have. But that being said, I don't want to be the schlub on our street who has the overgrown lawn. Yeah. That's the balance for me. Like I keep it cut and trimmed and neat, but I don't really care what's growing as long as there's some green shit growing. Yeah. What I don't like are the bare patches and where, you know, that kind of those problem areas. Mm-hmm. So that's where I put seed down. Yeah. I'm not that guy spending his whole Saturday out picking every single weed or bit of clover or anything out of there. Mm-hmm. I'm cool with that. That can stay. I'm going to cut it, but it's the bare patches and that like, as long as something's growing, I'm generally content. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's me too. Um, I, I, I will say the people on this street do have very nice lawns for the most part. So I do mm-hmm. feel a little bit insecure and like I need to up. You don't want to be that guy. I, yeah, I got to up my game a little bit. So I am trying to make uh, an effort to keep it looking nice just so I don't like, they're not like all oh, this young guy moves in on the street and he's just a hooligan playing drums in his basement and doesn't take care of anything. I'm not really. I do play drums in the basement, but I will take care of my lawn. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> Got to meet him halfway yeah, on something. Exactly. Yeah. How about you? Well, the other. Oh, sorry. You can go ahead. What were you going to say? I was just the other day, my neighbor, Danny, who I'm comfortable talking about here because I, I don't think he knows what the hell a podcast is. He's the 85 year old Italian at man. Least that, this is like four generations below him. <laughs> um, he's out cutting his grass. And I must have spent about 20 minutes watching because I was just trying to figure out why he was wearing a hard hat. <laughs> And did you figure it out? Not a damn clue. Falling so if branches. anybody has any ideas why no 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 trees on his front yard. Oh. Like I've got nothing, man. I thought about it. I looked at the radar. There's no hail coming in. <laughs> I've got nothing. So if anybody's got theories, I, hit me I up. I think you're just gonna have to bring him on the show. But, or like secretly. <laughs> just like go and chat with him with a wire. Like Yeah, yeah. I'm just gonna bring him on here with like, fully with FBI his consent. informant style. Yeah. 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 Let's do it. Yeah. That sounds good. Let's do it. Yeah. But what I've been working on, uh, I've been learning how to groom my own dog. Okay. Little COVID project. Can't get her into the groomers. I've got an Aussie doodle, so she doesn't really shed. So if her fur doesn't get clipped down, it gets real long and matted. So bought some clippers, watched about five dozen YouTube videos, read about five dozen articles. Dang. (laughs) How to go. Um, it's a lot trickier than I initially thought, but all my research definitely helped. Luckily, my dog's like the most cooperative thing on the planet and like yeah. didn't move an inch the whole time. That's good. Yeah. Uh, she's a good girl. So we got her trimmed up. Looks a lot better. I'm amazed at the infer- amount of fur I took off. It's just, I'm usually, just absurd. I feel like I've mostly seen her with a fairly short coat so does she get pretty long yeah she does get long usually um in the summers i try and keep it short because i do a lot of hiking and stuff with mm-hmm. her and if she's going to get a tick or something when her first long i don't i don't stand a chance at finding yeah. it so i like to keep it fairly short also just you know it's the amount of mud and grass and stuff that gets tracked into your house <laughs> if the fur is long it's it's never ending yeah uh, so I generally try and keep it pretty short, but I don't like it super short. So doing it myself at least gives me the option of doing it whenever I want. Yeah, for sure. Uh, there's definitely like I'm looking at it right now. It's like, there's some uneven spots. Like, <laughs> like I wouldn't, you know, don't hire me if you're putting your dog in the Westminster dog show. Yeah, you're, you're not going to do too well. That seems like uh, probably something no one would ever uh, be concerned about. In fact, you know what? Just don't pay me in general because I really don't know what I'm yeah, doing. Yeah, I don't. But, I don't uh, even know that you're offering dog grooming services. But <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. This is not an advertisement. <laughs> Could be. But yeah, been a fun project to try and learn. Cool. Her tail is not good. Fucked that up pretty good. Got some different levels going on on go. that. Just shave it. So some stuff to practice. Do, do you use a razor? To get like behind the neckline and like, there she is. There she is voicing her concerns. Stop talking about me, dad. Yeah. She knew we were making fun of her tail. Yeah. Um, Now I've got like good electric clippers and then different length combs you put on them. So I use like one length for most of the body and then I'll go a little shorter around like the neck where the collar rides um, behind the ears, under the legs where it tends to get knotted quicker. But you don't have like a straight razor you use to like get right down to the skin. No, I'm not doing like a barber shop thing. No, I think she deserved like a hot towel, like like the hot shaving cream and all that. Yeah, Yeah. she's a good girl. She deserves that. It's such a nice experience. (laughs) I mean, for, for people, maybe, yeah. Who knows? We should do that. Yeah. Let's open a barber shop for dogs. Yeah. Like, <laughs> sit down. Would you like a cappuccino, a cigar? Whiskey. Yeah. yeah. I think that would be sweet. We'd probably get some sort of animal abuse complaints or something. 100%. We don't really sell ourselves as good people. No, no, <laughs> no I realize that. We're, uh, we're really not great at self-promoting. Yeah, by the- our, our episode with Martin talking about how to talk yourself up in a job interview, apparently we did not take good notes. No, no. We, um, by the way, we're very sarcastic, at least I am, <laughs> most of the time, and there's no change in my voice when I'm being sarcastic or 100% serious. So it's sometimes hard to tell, especially with no video portion being here Um yeah, we're going to have to get video for our next round of episodes, I think, yeah. because people are going to need to get a better read on us. Yeah. We're pretty dry. Yeah. They're just like, who are these? These sound like absolute psychopaths when they talk about anything. <laughs> <laughs> Straight shaven dogs. 
<laughs> I feel like I, I, I gave Jeff a very bad intro. We're interviewing Jeff Richards. He's a chef. That's all I said. <laughs> well, I mean, he is a chef and he can talk about his own credentials better than we can. Yeah, that's true. On that note, we're going to be bringing Jeff in in about just a minute. So, uh, yeah, should we uh, should we close this Let's down? This. And then, uh, yeah. all righty, we got our buddy Jeff Richards here on the line with us. How you doing, Jeff? I'm good, guys. Thanks so much for having me today. Thanks for being here. <laughs> well, uh, Jeff, um, while we got you here to start, why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself and your background in cooking and being a chef? Sure. How'd you get um, into it? I started in restaurants when I was 15. I'm 32 now this year, so 17 years. Um, yeah, like I started off as like a little like a server and worked at the Swiss LA in Georgetown. That was like my first like serving gig and nice. um, way underage, but they didn't care about <laughs> anything uh, at all. And, you know, it, it kind of progressed from there. I kind of worked through a few restaurants and then took it a little bit more seriously in my early 20s. Um, had the opportunity of, you know, cooking uh, down south at Sean Brock's restaurant at Husk in Charleston, South Carolina. Cool. Uh, back when back when he was part of it, he's no longer part of that group, but I was there for, you know, three weeks and it was awesome. It was a great time. And um, but here, like in Toronto, like I've had the, you know, the fortunate um, side to be chef of like restaurants like uh, Harvard Room and Company and um I was like a senior chef at the time at like Taroni. Uh, I was executive chef of Holt Renfrew, um, multi-unit executive chef of school and motel in Hamilton. And now, um, and amongst the more other, as the restaurant world is, you, you float around quite a bit. Um, but now I'm the corporate executive chef overseeing um, union social restaurants, social eatery restaurants, uh, Wicked Chicken, Pie Squared, and cool. I consult for three wineries, two wineries on the side, two wineries right now. Yeah. So amongst the group as well. So we do that as well. But yeah, Dude, I had no idea that <laughs> it covered so much ground and so many restaurants I was familiar with. Like I knew right. about the whole Renfrew yeah. stuff. And mm -hmm. actually today I just took a, a little peek over at your Instagram page because I haven't been over there in a while and I was seeing Social Eatery, Wicked Chicken. I didn't know about Motel in Hamilton. Yeah. Like there's some pretty cool stuff on there and some like great menus. Yeah. Like I mean Motel like is that was lightning in a bottle. That was one of those things like coming from school in Liberty, I was approached by the GM at the time uh, he was opening a restaurant in Hamilton. He was like, do you want to do the menu and set it up for me and whatever? Because he had no back house experience. I was like, yeah, sure. And now, like, I did a dish on that menu called um, Champagne Pancakes. And they had, like, this Devonshire whipped cream on them, gold leaf, uh, raspberry, rosé, coolie, like, some crazy shit. And uh, that there's now a candle of that. Huh pancake scent that they that's sell amazing. It's, that's it's wild. Wild. where's wow. my where's my where's my royalties on that uh, yeah <laughs> but uh she negotiated a better contract there i <laughs> know <laughs> and uh no he's a great guy and chris is uh you know he's he has a great restaurant he's a great mind for restaurants and stuff uh he's a great dude so that's but, cool um yeah he's, he's he's fantastic but the, there's just moments of like i've been very fortunate and you know and recently with pre-pandemic like i was chef of a restaurant with anthony rose who owns um fat pass chef at zune schmaltz like all these incredible incredible restaurants and he's probably one of the best chefs in the country easily and uh Dang. he asked me to come open a restaurant with him and we opened up a restaurant called the grand elvis and we were open three weeks and we got uh, number eight best new restaurant in toronto life and it was like this huge milestone for us and personally for me and and then uh, COVID happened, and overnight the restaurant was gone. So wow, that's super shitty. Wow, it was it was awful. That was that was the worst. I think that was like a three month depression spiral yeah. that I was in. Yeah, I can it, was only like, it was not good. Especially mm. when it's the culmination of like such a long career, right, or such a lengthy yeah. resume to get to that position. Yeah, yeah. And we were doing food that was like at the time, like a year year a bit ago, like. Um, 
No one was doing it. Like it was, you know, we had the hottest grill, open grill in Canada. It was like 900 and plus degrees, like um, over wood fire that we'd like do a whole service with like, you know, two and a half pound strip loins and like all over open wood and fire and smoke. And it was just like, it was very cool. It was very Canadian, but very American at the same time, like very North American bistro, but relaxed, fun environment. He just never got a chance. They never got a chance. And yeah. I don't blame Anthony for, you know, post COVID or actually during COVID, but coming out of it to reopen big crow and Rose and sons like institutions in Toronto for years and years. So yeah. when you got to make sure that there's money coming in that till taking a chance on a restaurant, that's only been open five months, you know, compared to a restaurant that had legs for nine years is, you know, you got to go with the safer bet in, um, in that kind of uh, situation. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm sure that um, down the road though, based on everyone you've worked with and all the stuff that you've done, there'll be other chances for other cool op- like restaurants and stuff. like, you're so young and doing all that right, work with sure, all man. these cool people. Like there's going to be so many more opportunities. And, and it sounds like you're, totally. you're like a very outside the box guy when it comes right. to cooking a lot of the time. So, and just on that note, just to give uh, listeners a little bit more background, when COVID did hit, what did you, uh, where did you move from there in terms of restaurant? Yeah. So when COVID hit, we lost the restaurant. It went, didn't go under, it's just closed it and then never reopened it. And then my wife and I moved up North to my folks house in Grand Valley. I bought a smoker and my wife is incredible at design and, um, branding and her company paper and post are arguably one of the best in the country, what they do. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and we put together this restaurant called side road smoke and my dad and mom and Lex, my wife, and, uh, we built this commissary kitchen in the barn and, uh, I bought a smoker. We put it out there on Facebook up because that's how all these people up North kind of communicate is through Facebook, which is, Mm -hmm. which is really wild. And, uh, the first day I was like, Hey, like I'm doing ribs and I'm doing chicken, like whatever. We had like 70 orders, like come in. That's amazing. In like a few wow. hours. Damn. And I didn't have any of the food. Right. So I was like, <laughs> Oh shit. I'm like, this is not, this isn't good. So I, I called a bunch of buddies that like, you know, work in, you know, all the, the butchers and stuff like that. And I was like, fuck, you gotta help me. And, um, we got the food out and, making great money and i was working from home i only worked two days a week and i was like this is fucking great like i'm having a great time and my own boss and this is so good and then a competitor up north um that also owns a barbecue joint i was just destroying his business uh so he called um omafra on me which is the ontario ministry of agriculture food food and rural affairs Okay. That's like, it's some heavy header shit. Like, yeah. like he, he could have called the health inspector. Or they just would have come in and been like, you don't have any licensing <laughs> to own a restaurant. You got to stop. This guy calls Omafra, which is like, this dude shows up. I was, I had a huge order. It was like, uh, I think it was in June or something. And this guy, I get a text from my wife who's up at the house and she's like, there is a dude from the government. Here. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, fuck. So I like run to the barn, hide everything. Mind you, the kitchen was amazing in this barn. Like we had running water. Like it was a totally more more restaurants that I, I've seen in Toronto didn't have the cleanliness of this place ad man. And, <laughs> and uh, it was so funny. This dude walks in and he's like, hey, like. I'm from Omafra. I'm like, holy shit. Like, what the hell are you doing here, man? Like, you should not be here. And he's like, I heard you're operating a illegal uh, barbecue business. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, d- d- what, what do you think I- illegal means? Like, you and I may have two totally different interpretations of what illegal is. Like, I'm just trying to make a buck um, during a pandemic. And he's like, well, you know, show me around. And I showed him around. He's like, this actually looks fantastic. Like, yeah. He loved it. <laughs> Uh, but he's like, listen, I gotta, I gotta shut you down. I'm like, well, I got like, um, thousands of dollars worth of orders that need to go out tomorrow. Like I had been smoking all day and getting all this barbecue going. And he's like, yeah, no, like, uh, no, you can't. And I was like, well, let's just say I did like, let's just say I did do it one more day. 
you know, like what would happen? He goes, Oh, I'm going to fine you $50,000. I was like, oh, okay, well, <laughs> looks like I'm closed. Yeah. So I had to call every person that placed an order. It was like 70 something orders. I called every single person. E transferred everybody's money back. Um, I got stuck with the bill on hundreds and hundreds of dollars of the meat. Um, and then, yeah, so then I lost that at the same time. So it was like, oh, shit. Now I lost this job. The government doesn't want me doing this. So then I drove out to a place uh, in Durham, Ontario, which is like a town of three and a half thousand people, mm-hmm. just between Mount Forest and Owen Sound. And, uh, yeah, we opened an actual storefront called Side Road Smoke, and I got proper licensing. I did the whole <laughs> thing that we've done for years. And I'm like, okay, fine. Uh, but the rent was like... 700 bucks a month for like 1600 square feet of restaurant space. It was amazing. It was, yeah, Yeah. like nothing costs anything up there, right? Like everything is like, everything's 300 bucks, as my mom always says. (laughs) Always 300 bucks. And uh, yeah, and we opened that and we ran it until October. And then I got offered a gig back in Toronto to oversee all the restaurants here uh, for Union Social and all them. And that's what I've been doing. That's awesome, man. Man, quite a journey. Okay. Yeah, it's been a hell of a year. Yeah, yeah, that's a really like most people's when they explain what COVID has been for them, it's a really boring story. <laughs> that was easily yeah. the most interesting COVID story I've heard all year. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was. It kept the yeah. It yeah. kept us afloat, man. It, yeah, like that sure. that money, you know, it paid my wife and I, and paid our bills and kept us afloat for the year, and it was a really cool experience and. Yeah, you still right. kind of got to do what you love to do, which is cooking food, totally. and, and she got to do the design stuff. Because I remember seeing all the designs on like online, and I was like, mm-hmm. "Damn, that looks amazing!" Like everything in the restaurant yeah. was so short lived. So short. It was a uh, no, man. It was a it was a dream, and the people up there are like salt of the earth, right? Like they just want to support anybody yeah. they can that's local. Like big box can go to hell. Like they just want to make sure that the little guy is getting enough money, and we were doing great like we were open four days a week and making like good money and it had to end it it did have to end because the landlord saw how much money we were making and they wanted to double our rent so it was like right i I, i'm not going to and the winters up there are not something you can screw around with so there's no foot traffic in uh in durham ontario uh in the winter but uh durham ontario man if you've it has one of the most beautiful waterfalls and swimming areas that you can go to. If you're ever looking for a weekend away, that is a beautiful place to go. It's, nice. It's really, really nice. That's awesome. Yeah. Before we get too far into this today, what are we drinking this afternoon? It's always Bud Light. <laughs> always, <laughs> always Bud Light. Go-to. Always Bud Light. All I'm right. either drinking really good bourbon um, or I'm drinking Bud Light. Um, I don't like beer that doesn't taste like beer. Like the hoppy, like my father-in-law always gives me shit. Cause back when we were, you know, first dating Lex and I, like I always used to bring him like amazing beers and he, he'd always want to split it with me. And like down under, I'm like, I don't want to split this with him because I don't like these beers. <laughs> like I knew he'd like them. And then one day I was like, you know what, Tim, I don't fucking like these beers. Like, I don't like them. I like these beers, like Bud Light, Miller Light and like the worst beer is Paps. Just like, that's what I like. Just like a, <laughs> yeah. a light lager. Yeah, easy, man. Easy so, drinking Sunday afternoon beer. That's right, you know, and and I I hate Tall Boys. That's a thing I hate as well. But they only had Tall Boys. I like small cans, like because I can. I find that you get to here, and it's just like it gets warm. Gross. It gets warm. Yeah, I like to crush a beer. So fair enough. Yeah. Well, cheers. cheers. I I'm not much of a Bud Light drinker, but I'll drink one today <laughs> with you, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> cheers, cheers, boys. I'm not going to lie. I grabbed another lager. I picked up a Bud Light in the store and was instantly just like transported back to being 18 years old, puking in a (laughs) dorm room. I (laughs) I was like, oh, it's just one of those tastes for me. I'm like, that memory comes right back. Yeah, it's it's tough. It's a tough one. Yeah, I have that with Bavaria. Bavaria is the one that I taste it. I'm like, I got to go home. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I'm t- tasting notes of hops and barley malt, you know, like the really. <laughs> hey, dude, it is. It's good legs. From what I hear, <laughs> it is one of the most filtered beers you can buy. So it's really easy on the stomach. That's it what is. I do know. Yeah. About you know it goes down, it's very goes down easily. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. So much of what we wanted to ask you about, Jeff, is basically targeting people who, let's say you're getting your first place and you don't really know what the hell you're doing in a kitchen. Maybe you've helped your parents a little bit. You did a little cooking in university, but let's not kid ourselves. It was mostly shit. Right. So um, kind of get that getting started. So what are some things that you should pretty much always have stocked in your pantry? Always have stocked in your pantry. Yeah. Like, Pasta is something you should always have stocked in your pantry. Dried pasta, every single time is going to be fine, you know. And <laughs> and it's one of those things that I I, I hate the conception that um, fresh pasta is always better, which is complete bullshit. Like it's not <laughs> true at all. Um, dried pasta is just as good as fresh pasta, if not better, for some circumstances. Like <laughs> if you use a, a fresh pasta, yeah, you want to use it with like more of a ragu based and like heavy tomato sauce base absolutely but if you're using dried pasta use it for oil based pastas and buttery pastas it holds better it clings better um so like that's one thing and then like i always keep um canned tomatoes or posada strained tomatoes mm -hmm. um in my pantry as well so right there you have a pasta pomodoro and you're talking like three dollars and it will feed you for three days and it's really it, it could be fucking phenomenal like if you just add like some chili flake and a little bit of garlic and like or some basil and whatever like you have a really nice dish and it's super impressive um but yeah pasta and tomatoes pantry 101 for sure there you go and with that yeah. like Sounds like an understated meal, but sometimes would you say some of the best meals can be understated? It's just what you do with few ingredients. Like, yeah, like everything is about purpose. Like that, that's where I get driven with food is like, why? Like, it's always why, why, why? Like, why is this ingredient on the plate? What's its purpose? Is it adding to the dish, taking away from the dish or making the dish worse? And if it's, uh, if it's making it the same, um, or it's making it worse, whatever ingredient you're adding, it's not worth doing. But if it makes the dish better, then it is worth doing. So the most, the best dishes in the world are the most simple dishes in the world. And that's why shrimp cocktail has never gone out of style. It's because yeah. it's, it's fucking perfect. And, <laughs> um, and pasta pomodoro, it's perfect. And classics are classics for a reason. And I think that's where people are right now when it comes to food and eating. And like, don't get me wrong, like I love tasting menus and I love very high quality, high end food, but you could still do, you know, some of the best Michelin uh, restaurants in the world do very simple, simple food. It's just their ingredients are just better than what you can get. And that's what makes them better than you um, is the ability to have San Marzano tomatoes fresh from Italy. Like that's a huge thing or Pilati and like all these like amazing ingredients. So yeah, the, the best foods are the foods that don't try. Like it's, they're just good because they trying, are good. It's just good. Yeah. It's good <laughs> because it's good. And that's what Anthony Rose and I always used to say is like, it's like, what do you guys want to do for this menu? Like what's, what's the inspiration behind the menu at Grand Elvis? And we're like, it's good food. Like that's the inspiration is that we're not trying to pick a lane and say that we're a Chinese restaurant or an Italian restaurant or a Greek restaurant. Like, no, we're a restaurant that makes good food. And that's, I think that's all that matters. Everything mm -hmm. else is just noise. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, with that, so you, you're saying always keep your, your dried pasta stocked, your canned tomatoes, other probably lots of canned goods you can just have in there to always. But what about spices? Like what are the spices that you should always have on hand that can always just like elevate your simple dishes to that next level? Because sure, you can pour your tomato sauce in there and just cook it up and then mm -hmm. that's it. But obviously if you add, like you said, add some fresh garlic or fresh sure. basil, what about other dried spices anyone can have in their home? What, what are the most important ones? Sure. Yeah. Like chili flake, a uh, whole nutmeg, that's a huge one. Never buy ground nutmeg, never buy ground cinnamon. Um, those are, you don't know. The whole funny thing is about the ground cinnamon and the ground nutmeg is everyone thinks that like at the plant, when they're making it, that's what's swept off the floor, right? <laughs> it's in the processing part. Like, cause you don't really know, like, cause nutmeg doesn't come in a ground form and not many things do come in a ground form. So whatever mm -hmm. you can get yourself in a whole form, like whole peppercorns, uh, for black peppercorns or whatever, grinding those yourself 
that's the way it's intended to be. And if you get yourself some cumin and, you know, chili flakes, garlic powder, cayenne, smoked paprika, and then if you want to, like, branch out in, like, the chilies, like, get, like, espelette, which is, like, a Spanish type of, like, chili powder. And, like, there's, like, little things that, like, I always have chili flakes, peppercorns, Mm -hmm. and salt. And... Generally speaking, those are the three things I put in at, like almost every single dish. Like, um, but yeah, like it's keeping the staple items in your spice rack at all times. There's nothing wrong with, you know, dried oregano and dried thyme and, you know, all these good things. But like, for the most part, they're so inexpensive to buy fresh and they don't get dusty like they do in your in your pantry and mm-hmm. your spice rack, like you might as well just buy a fresh bunch of, you know, parsley. And then if you do not use it all, like then you can dry it out yourself and then you have dried parsley, but, um, herbs, I prefer to use fresh because there's nothing worse to me than like dried rosemary. It's like the most disgusting. <laughs> it doesn't taste like it. It tastes like potpourri. Like it's not even, <laughs> close so um i I see a lot of things online too where people are like if you're like basically trying to not waste fresh stuff that you buy you can throw them in a freezer bag and just kind of there's your soup stock right there so anything to add on to that like just making a simple soup stock base that you can quickly have it take stock like stock is you know that's how we save money in restaurants right Um, When we, you know, when we have bones left over from chicken, we make like a chicken stock or whatever. And uh, then when you have like leftover vegetables, that's how you make your veggie stock. And then when you have leftover veal bones or beef bones, that's when you start making your beef stock and then into your demi glaze and all that kind of stuff. So the best thing to do for a lot of people is that they have leftover herbs. They make their veggie stock or their chicken stock. That's when you just put your herbs into an ice cube tray you pour your chicken stock or veggie stock or beef stock over that, and then you just put it in the freezer. So then when you do need it, you pop them out and you throw them in a saucepan and they melt, and then you have stock. So that works. Uh, that's We do it on a more larger scale in restaurants. We like make huge batches of stock because no one's mm-hmm. making like a liter at a time. Yeah, You're going to make like 40 liters at a time, yeah. and then you're going to freeze it all because it'll freeze for a few months and you'll definitely use it. And then when you need one, you pull one the night before, and then it thaws out overnight in the fridge, and then you use it. But using it in an ice cube tray with leftover herbs, sure. There's, you know, carrot, celery, onion, like a little mirepoix, water, chicken bones, boil the hell out of it, skim the shit off the top, then <laughs> you have chicken stock. Like, that's it. Like, it's not, a big, it's not a big feat, but it's, I really hate wasting food. It's just... Yeah. You know, it's the same when people are like, I hate when you throw out a piece of, you know, fish that you didn't eat the night before that you knew you had to eat, but you wanted to get takeout and uh, you, know, you end up strong. <laughs> it's always, but it's always, I'm, I am guilty of it. I've, I've done it before, but it's the same thing with vegetables. Like just because something doesn't have a heartbeat doesn't mean it didn't give its fucking life to you that blew it and you didn't eat that pepper and it rotted in your fridge. And that's what everyone always has a problem with when they buy spinach like those huge fucking bags of spinach. Yeah. <laughs> and they're like i'm never gonna eat it it's like yeah but spinach wilts down to like literally nothing so just cook with more spinach and um but yeah it's it's one of those things it's you can easily make stocks and all that stuff ahead of time and just freeze it up and sweet that's great advice yeah i've never actually made my own um stock like chicken stock but yeah i always do end up just throwing out the bones so i think that I've got yeah. some chicken right now that I'm going to cook tonight, and maybe I'll just keep those bones, throw them in a bag, and and just see what I Perfect. can do with it. Yeah, freeze them, freeze the bones. Like the bones will freeze, and put them all into a sauce pot, and let them boil for like four hours or overnight or whatever. Not overnight, I guess, because you're not in a restaurant. But you know, like <laughs> let them boil during the day when you're home, like putting around or working, and then you have this amazing chicken stock, which you can fortify into a a pasta. You can add it for a soup. You can you can do so much. And like a big thing, a side note, just because it's chicken stock doesn't mean it can't be used with beef or fish. Uh, some of the best food in the world, like if you do like a chicken stock and then you 
you know, you have your flour and your butter, you make your roux and then you add your chicken stock. Now you have a gravy, right? Like now that's, that's it. Mm -hmm. Um, that on fish, like on a white piece of like a white fish primarily. So nothing like an oily fish, like a Arctic char, trout, salmon, something like that. But, uh, chicken gravy on fish is fucking phenomenal. Like it's so good. And I wouldn't go beef on fish, but like chicken and fish, like it's so good. But I made food the other night that we did a chicken gravy over beef and it tastes great. You don't have to, it's like red wine and white wine. Like just because it's red doesn't mean it has to go with red food, like Mm -hmm. red meat. Like that's not true at all. (laughs) It's not true. That's just marketing bullshit. It's not true. (laughs) Yeah. That's great. So another uh, kitchen staple that I feel like a lot of people, myself included until a little more recently, don't know much about are the various cooking oils and the differences Mm. between them. Um, Mm -hmm. There's so many different kinds, it seems now. What are some of like the basic things people need to know about different oils and what they should have? Yeah. I mean, like canola oil, it's a high temp oil. So that's an oil that we use in deep fryers and restaurants. So that's what you want to use for frying and high searing. Um, it has a high smoke point. Basically, that means it can go up to like a certain amount of degrees, probably like 400 degrees before it starts smoking. And that's when you start burning the oil. Um, so canola oil is for high temp cooking. Uh, pretty simple. Olive oil is not for high temp cooking. And everyone always uses it for high temp cooking. Olive oil is for finishing and for vinaigrettes and aiolis and sauces and that kind of stuff. Um, when you plate your dish up and you have your big, beautiful bowl of pasta and then you drizzle some olive oil on top, like you wouldn't drizzle canola oil on top. You would drizzle olive oil or an extra virgin or whatever you want to call it, uh, which is also bullshit. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> something like a nice high quality olive oil uh, on top. Uh, because canola oil gives you that like uh, oily feel on your lips. Like it makes you feel like you're wiping. Like it's mm. that worse kind of feeling. And then you get peanut oil. Peanut oil is the best to fry in, period. Uh, the flavor of peanut oil adds a lot to the food that you fried in. Um, so Obviously I would it's avoided use... though because of allergies and right. that, that restricts is, maybe your client base or something if you're totally. in a restaurant setting. But at home, if Absolutely. you don't have peanut allergy, maybe start cooking. So you're with it. Yeah. Yeah. Fried chicken and peanut oil is super Southern and that's the way that they've always done it. Uh, so that's like, we have that discussion all the time. My bosses and I, cause we all want peanut, but we don't want to like make anybody feel like they can't eat. So that's a huge problem, but yeah, peanut high temp sesame oil. I wouldn't sear with sesame oil. It smokes. Uh, it also has a very delicate flavor. Uh, I like to add it in. Like if you're making like, um, you know, a stir fry, Mm-hmm. Uh, like add it in at the very end, like when you have your noodles in or your rice in there, uh, then you add your, your, your sesame oil in and you give it a nice toss. That's when I would do sesame oil, super underrated. It's delicious in small quantities. It's kind of like truffle oil, which is disgusting, but, um, <laughs> don't eat truffle oil. I'm just going to say it. Like don't I've eat never it. even heard of truffle oil. Me I don't even know what truffle is. oil. Don't eat truffle oil. And anybody listening to this, like don't fucking eat it. it it's made <laughs> with the same ingredients as Astroglide. It's disgusting. <laughs> uh, it has no trace amount of fucking truffle in it. Like it's one of those things. It's like when you get like, um, like I love like sparkling waters, but like when you get like La Croix and people are like, it's like, you know, tangerine or pineapple essence. Yeah. Uh, it's, that's what it is. It's like, you know, someone yelling from the back, like this tastes like truffle. And that's what it tastes like. It's like very, <laughs> but don't, don't eat truffle oil. But yeah, sesame oil, super underrated, delicious, actually made from sesame um what about just plain old vegetable oil same thing or is that canola oil that's same same. thing canola yeah but i would use canola oil it's canadian we grow canola here like that's our big thing canola fields everywhere like where my folks live um i love canola oil it's great it's you know i think having investing when you go to the store and you go to the grocery store and you buy a bottle of olive oil and it's like 5.99 and you get this like 750 mil or 500 mil bottle of olive oil. And it says like extra virgin olive oil or whatever, light tasting olive oil, which is just olive oil and canola mixed, um, <laughs> which is also pomace oil. It's bullshit. So just buy 
for ten dollars, eleven dollars, like a nice bottle of olive oil. Like you can buy some really good ones that are delicious and taste like olives, and they have this like incredible like sweet and bitterness, and like it's perfect for tossing into a vinaigrette because you want. That's those little things that make a dish mediocre to really great. It's just using a better ingredient. And just because something's on sale, like I totally understand. But investing in an olive oil, if you cook at home a lot, like it's huge. You're going to use it all the time. Like olive oil is always, I'm not saying you can't sear an olive oil. You can. It's just you have a higher chance of burning it mm-hmm. than you do canola oil. So I always find if I am trying to cook with olive oil and like it does end up smoking on the frying pan, yeah, like right. super early. And I'm like, why am I doing this? Like, this is, doesn't right. seem like the right <laughs> oil for this, but it's just what I have. So, right. And I mean, if you get to that point where like you're cooking with olive oil and uh, it starts getting too hot too quick, the first thing you got to do is like, obviously you take it off the heat, but add more olive oil to it mm. and it just cools it down. And okay. it just immediately cuts the smoke. So if you just take it off the heat and you add more olive oil to your olive oil, the heat drops from X amount to this amount, and it stops smoking instantly. There you so, go. All right. I can't go. believe I that. never would have thought of that. <laughs> it sounds <laughs> yeah, so simple in. when you say it. But <laughs> I, I burnt I the oil. I should throw out the frying pan. I guess that's yeah. the only solution. <laughs> I see no other way. One one thing I wanted to kind of touch on is like like – Everyone knows how to just cook their mac and cheese at home mm-hmm. or their soups or their they got their Mr. Noodles or, or a classic sandwich. Those are the things that anyone knows how to make. But is there a way to bring those to the next level? Yeah. Like, I mean, if you want to do like um, a mac and cheese better, it's just using better cheese. Like that's all it is. <laughs> and um, yeah, or using a better noodle. Um Never a long noodle for mac and cheese, like a few silly or like a, which is like that corkscrew one, uh, or a rigatoni, uh, which is really really great. Or you know nothing wrong with the macaroni as well. Um, but, but the stuff that comes in the KD box is uh, is that the lowest <laughs> quality of the lowest quality noodles? There? Yeah, I don't, yeah. I don't even think those are noodles. Like I don't think they're actually made. Uh, don't get me wrong, I love. Craft dinner, and I love the spiral craft dinner, which is my favorite one. I think it tastes better. I don't know why. It's since I was a kid, I argued this with my brothers all the time. I'm like, this one's fucking better, and I think they're on my side now. Um, <laughs> well, but, they uh, be. you're the one who became a chef. <laughs> yeah, they can't That's argue right. with you now. I mean, I'm very lucky. I have a whole family of people that know how to cook very, very well. So, um, yeah, they're they they're really good. But they, you know, if you want to make a really good mac and cheese, like. Use a better cheese. Like, use a smoke cheddar. Like, that sounds great to me. Like, mm-hmm. um, you use chicken stock or veggie stock. Like, use a better stock instead of just using, you know, if you're going to use, like, a stock and then add cream to your roux or whatever. So, like, you want to make – like, it's very simple. Like, with a roux and then you add milk or cream to that, then you made a bechamel, and then which is a mother sauce of the five. And then you – Add cheese to that. Now you've made a Mornay, which is a cheese sauce, which is a mac and cheese sauce, right? All of these sound um, so fancy, and we're talking about mac and cheese fancy, here. <laughs> right? And that's why if you just say, well, I'm making a, make a mac and cheese today, you just be like, no, I'm making a, you know, noodles tossed in Mornay. Like, it's, it is what it is. <laughs> yeah. And people will be like, oh, this guy's fucking fancy. Yeah, you can serve that um, on a date now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you, you know, use Pecorino. Use um, Grana Padano and Parmigiano Reggiano and smoked cheddars or Gruyere. Like, don't use, like, brie or something like that. You want something that, like, melts in really nicely and kind of emulsifies into it. But use better cheese, you know, um, just take the time to think about it and just elevate it from there. And then if you want to make like, like a sandwich better, like use better bread, use better meat. Like maybe instead of buying deli meats, maybe you got a whole turkey breast and you roasted it yourself and you slice it super thin. Like it's instantly going to be a better sandwich. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's really not that expensive. Like you can buy turkey legs, for example, at the grocery store for like three bucks for like two huge turkey legs. And if you just braise those, take the meat off and like it's delicious. It's so good. And um, yeah, like instant ramen, like just add pork belly, add braised chicken, add, you know, sesame oil, cilantro, lime, 
Sambal, like chilies, like there's just things in your cupboard that you can easily soy sauce, tam mm -hmm. uh, tamarind, like you can add all these things to your. Um, I don't know if this no longer makes it a ramen, but this is something that <laughs> I do with my ramen is I just pour a um, big thing of coconut milk in there and it gives it like sure. this creamy flavor and some curry spices and stuff like that. And I, like it mm -hmm. just basically becomes like a creamy soup instead of like a watery soup, which I don't know if there's more professional chefy terms for those that I'm not aware of. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there is a there's a ramen in Japanese culture. I think it's I don't want to sound wrong in case anyone on that listens is like oh, actually chef you're fucking wrong is uh <laughs> it's, i think it's called tonkatsu ramen and basically what they do is for tonkatsu ramen i think it's tonkatsu it's one of those they boil the pork bones to obliteration like until it releases this cloudy creamy taste so mm -hmm. the broth and the ramen like when you go eat actually like a, a real ramen restaurant or ram yen uh restaurant um they have this like it has this like cloudy creamy you know better tasting ramen so you're not wrong at all like it tastes better and coconut milk is super underrated and fucking phenomenal it works it's so versatile and smoothies mm -hmm. you know curries stews like it's it's a really great ingredient so what would be like five of the more versatile ingredients that you could have at all times that would either elevate what you are cooking or open up some more opportunities to cook some new dishes? Yeah, I mean, like the, the five that I always have are butter, lemon, chilies, butter, lemon, chilies, um, fresh herbs and Parmesan. Now, it doesn't have to just be Parmesan. It could be Pecorino. It could be Grana Padana. It could be whatever. Uh, but those five things, there's, you know, there's a show on Netflix, but she's an incredible chef, but there's a, a saying that it's like every dish should have salt, fat, acid, and heat. And that's super true. Like those are the four things that like hit your tongue. Uh, the heat is so necessary. And I know people are like, I don't like spicy food. It's like, there's a difference between heat, warmth, spicy, and then fucking kill you. Like there's differences <laughs> like across the board and a little bit of chili flake just gives you that tingle because it, your body thinks you're being poisoned. So it releases serotonin and it makes you happy. So it's so necessary to eat chilies. Like they make you happy. Um, and then butter, everything is better with butter. It's, it's this true. is a body, body <laughs> built by butter. Like this is, <laughs> We go through cases and cases and cases of butter at restaurants. Like it's, and you know, I worked in some really great Italian restaurants, <laughs> Tironi, and they always claim that they never use butter in Italian cooking. And that's a big thing they always claim. It's always olive oil, right? The French use butter, Italians use olive oil, and it's bullshit. And it is bullshit. Uh, <laughs> everything is mounted with butter. And that means at the very end of your dish, you put butter in and you toss it and that's what makes everything velvety and creamy and that's why you go to a restaurant and you're like man this dish tastes so much better than i could do at home it's like really all we're doing is mounting everything with butter like that's it <laughs> that's and the secret that's the secret and i think everything in regards you can ask any of my cooks and chefs that work for me and over the years they always know that i have dozens upon dozens of lemons on the line at all times because i think every dish for the most part should be finished with lemon. Like just like, cause it doesn't taste like lemon. It's the acid. It just, it, you have to have something that bounces off that fat and bounces off that heat and bounces off that salt. Like it, it needs to wake the dish up. It's refreshing for your palate as you're a guest eating the food. It's something which just savory on savory on savory, like a, like a fucking poutine. Um, you're not like, eventually you're going to go, Bleh, like, I'm not gonna, I can't finish this. So, having those components fight against each other and then work in harmony is so important. Hmm. Cause I've heard something huh. before that a lot of the time, the reason that you feel full while you're eating something, but you still have room for dessert is because <laughs> your mouth has gotten just tired of this one type of flavor, but your brain mm -hmm. wants something up like you, like it, 
when yeah. you get that sweetness of like ice cream or like cake or something after totally. dinner, you're like, your brain's like, <laughs> whoa, this is totally different from what I've been having for the last hour. Like right. I'm in, yeah. like, let's go. That comes down to like an anthropological thing, right? Like that comes down to when we as a race or cavemen and all this kind of stuff. And imagine you're eating fucking caribou or elk or whatever the hell you're hunting and then fish and yada, yada. It's savory. It's savory. It's savory the whole time. And then someone stumbles upon sugar cane and they eat the sugar cane and it like pings in their brain, right? Like, whoa, 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 this is so much better. Like it's sweet. And it's like all their sensory in their mouth are just like bing, 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 bing. And that's something that we still fight with to this day is that sweetness and that dessert. And that's why like when we're eating a savory food, when we have that sweet thing, like you said, Dill, like you're just like, what the fuck? Like, this is like, I have room for it now. And as like a chef in a restaurant in, in restaurants that like, I'm here to make money for my bosses. That's my major thing. But also I'm here to make you happy. And the worst thing in the world that doesn't make anybody happy is when you're full as fuck. No one's happy when they're, grossly full and like if you're taking someone out on a first date or you're out with family and you're sitting at a dinner i don't think as a person that is giving you food in terms of quantity and quality and like whatever i'm determining how much you eat tonight in terms of plate size and portions i think you should always have room for dessert because you shouldn't ever be full you should always be content like that's like mm -hmm. a big thing and because if you're full i don't get you buying dessert and then you don't buy dessert and then I lose out on an extra 20 bucks. And then you don't maybe buy an Amaro for digestion uh, <laughs> with your dessert or an ice wine and things that matter like to my bottom line. And those are things that like they work on both ends. We're like, I need to make money off you because of dessert. You want dessert. You have room for dessert because it is different, but like you should never be full. And like, yeah, man, it's such a funny thing that you mentioned. I think about it all the time is that, there's always room for dessert, and you're absolutely right. It's such a weird, bizarre thing, no matter how full you are. So you're saying when you go out to a restaurant, you should always try to, if you're feeling full, pack it up, and you'll have some great leftovers for tomorrow, and pack then eat dessert because you're well, out at a restaurant. And like, right. right where we are right now, recording in April 2021, and I haven't been to sit down in a <laughs> restaurant in over a year, I don't think yeah. I will ever pass up the luxury of no. stick sticking around a little longer, eating a dessert, oh. having a, a post meal Coffee. beverage. Like there's nothing better than when you finish your meal. Like, why is it that when you finish your meal, the night's over? Like, it makes no sense to me. Like my wife and I are huge, huge believers that like, she, she doesn't like sweets at all. You know, she always gets a cheese board to finish. Oh. Like that's what she'll get. Like she'll get like some cheese and some bread and, then I usually will get like I'll either nibble on like whatever she got or like I'll have an Amaro, which is like a digestif, like Montenegro or Fernet or something like that. Or I'll have another glass of wine or I'll have cocktail. I won't have beer like after I eat because it's just going to make you full. But, like it's such a nice feeling if you had like you finish your meal and you're like, can I get you anything else? And you're like, no, just the bill. It's like, fuck, man, like you're at a restaurant where this never happens where someone comes up to you in your home and goes, do you want any cocktail of all time? Do you want any <laughs> glass of wine that you've always wanted to try? Like this is the time to, especially now that we've been indoors for so long is to really take advantage of finishing your meal and then enjoy a drink. Like you don't have to eat, but have a glass of bourbon, have an Amaro, have a little bit of cheese, like have some sorbet, which is like a nice light, you know, dessert and a coffee. Like I, I just, I'm a huge believer in the night doesn't have to be over just because you finished your mains. Like, and you don't have to have dessert either, but there's this incredible bar probably behind you that has thousands of recipes that they can whip up for you. So yeah, man, like, especially coming out of this, like if you don't think I'm dropping $400 the next time I go out to eat, like you are <laughs> out of your mind. I'm going to buy everything. I literally said to Emily uh, the other night, we we ordered some sushi from this place in Hamilton, and it was really good. And I was like, right. like, this is just takeout sushi. 
I can't wait until we're able to go into the restaurant. And I don't know if maybe you can speak as a chef. If someone goes into the restaurant and they say, hey, man, I'd like to spend 150 bucks tonight on food. Can you whip up like some of your favorite things that like sure. you think I will enjoy? Um, like I'm pretty open to anything because that's yep. what I want to do. I want to go to this Japanese restaurant and be like, I don't know what like half of your menu is because it's not yeah. part of my culture, but I would love to try some of your favorite things. And like, I love your food. So just give me yeah. what you got and here's the money. Like I'm, ha- I want to eat something. Is that a weird <laughs> thing to do or well, is that? It's not. That's called omakase. Like in Japanese cuisine, like that's called omakase. And omakase means you're putting your hand, like yourself in the hands of the chef. And that's where the tasting menu idea comes from is mm-hmm. that when you go to like Allo, which is the best restaurant in Canada over here in Toronto, like um, you don't get to choose what you eat tonight. Like you're not choosing. Like they want to know what's going to kill you if you eat it <laughs> and typically what you don't like. That's all they care. If it's preference, they don't really give a shit. And that's how it should always be when you go to a restaurant. If you don't like pickles on your burger, but we do burgers with pickles, just take it off. You're not allergic to it. Like those are things that like when you go to a restaurant and you want the chef or you want the restaurant to take care of you, you need to be very deliberate in what you want. And it's just saying like, hey, listen, I'm allergic to peanuts. I'm allergic to soy. Other than that, I have no food problems at all. I want to spend X amount of money order for me. I don't care. Just let it come out as it comes. And the chef back there, man, I'm telling you, when people used to do that for us, we used to love these people because it's, that's the way to eat. Like I never really think that like there is a family style way of eating, which I'm a big fan of and tapas and that kind of stuff. But we never, before I started working for like more groups that, you know, people want what they want. So they, they, they want to get their one burger. You're not going to really share a burger, mm-hmm. but like at Elvis, man, like it didn't come out at the same time. We determined when you ate. So we'd send out this first and then we'd wait five minutes, 10 minutes. We'd look at your table. The server would make that judgment call that you're now you're finishing your, your gnocchi. So we're going to send you this cabbage salad now. And that's what we're going to do. And, but putting yourself in the hands of a server or putting yourself in the hands of a chef, like, it's the best way to eat because we're going to respond to that. Like we're going to be like this guy, this girl, this person, they, them, they want to make sure that they want to eat tonight and they want to eat the best way possible. And they don't really have any opinion and they don't have any really problem. Like we love that type of cuisine and we love that type of service. So yeah, man, omakase, go to a Japanese omakase, oh, just sit down and they'll just send you sushi. They'll just That's put sushi. They'll put that sushi. sounds amazing. Dude, it's amazing. And they'll just sit there and they go, here you go. And they'll put it right in front of you. And it's like, I don't know what this is, but bon appetit, man. And you just <laughs> bang it out. And it's so good. That sounds awesome. I feel like like I've just got a totally different perspective on like the experience of going and dining at a restaurant after all this too. Like I Yeah. It's an experience and it's something I miss so much right now. And I like when, when things are back, I'm definitely going to, to one of your restaurants when you're working and being like, yeah. Jeff, you, you got to help me out here. What am I getting? <laughs> make me food. <laughs> yeah, make me food. Like, that's like, it's because at the end of the day, it's all it is. Like, it's just food. Like, it's. Yeah. It's, and you're going to eat it again and, you tomorrow know, and you ate yesterday and it's one of right. your meals. But, like, let's make 100%. it nice. Our, our jobs make you happy. And that's exactly it. My, like, Anthony always used to yell, always in the kitchen, like, make it nice. Make it nice. Make it nice. Make, like you just yell it and yell it because that's our job. Like you want a burger? Like, yeah, like we'll make you a burger. Like it's supposed to be better than what you can make at home. And mm-hmm. you want a really good night out and you want to have a lot of good time. That is our responsibility as hospitality professionals. And it starts with the person that you greet at the door and it ends with that bill and how that bill was given to you. And it's steps of service that, you know, rules are made to be broken. Um, so if you, you know, if we don't generally do that type of service, doesn't mean that we won't. It's something that someone's probably never interacted with you before about or anybody about. So I think there's a huge, like, there's an abuse side of that where, like, you can go to a restaurant and be, like, a total dipshit and, like, really, like, try and be, like, bougie about the whole kind of service but Mm -hmm. if you're a person that just wants to go in and you're like i don't have any preference i don't want to think about it 
here's my fucking credit card. Ring it up. There's two of us tonight. We want to have a couple starters, a couple mains, and a couple desserts, and a couple glasses of wine. Just just send us what you love. I'm telling you, man, you will get the best service ever, ever. They they will love you. They'll love you. <laughs> I, I'm so antsy right now to go to a restaurant. Yeah. <laughs> so am I, man. Dave, I wanted yeah. to ask you a question, Dave. Um, have you ever worked in the restaurant industry in any capacity before? I have not. And I know you two have, but I <laughs> absolutely have not. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I have a little bit. I worked, um, had a Boston pizza for oh, I love Boston a pizza. couple of years. I worked at a wild wing for like four love years. I was like a kitchen manager there for a little while. Simple stuff. Oh. But it, and I worked at a spicy Garpar, Joe's. man. Oh, spicy <laughs> Garpar. So good. <laughs> it's the best one. Farmer's daughter. So good. I, I was just, I just wanted to see if you had, cause it, it really is interesting. Um, for a lot of people working in restaurants is kind of a first job and like a gateway into other career paths just to get them work experience or some money working in high school. But you're obviously, you are obviously someone who like you got the bug, it bit you and you love the restaurant life and cooking. And like, I just mm-hmm. wanted to know, like you said, you started working at Swiss chalet. Um, mm-hmm. Was, do you remember a specific moment when you were like, I want to do this forever. I mean, I grew up in a household. My parents met. My dad used to run Smitty's and Golden Griddles in the 80s. Oh, man. And those are some institutions. You Did know, he run Smitty's in Georgetown? No, he didn't. Oh, okay. No, he didn't. But uh, all in Mississauga, I'm pretty sure. Okay. And, uh, you know, so I grew up with a with a – my mother was an incredible, you know, I guess now we would call them – like a maitre d', like a person that's at the front and mm-hmm. the person that kind of like, you know, um, greets guests. And she was a really great host and um, uh, server. My dad was a phenomenal manager. My dad's just a very business oriented dude. But, you know, at a young age, like at 22, I think, my dad was a GM, like of a restaurant. And that's just a testament to, to how, you know, he had good head on his shoulders, gave a shit mm-hmm. and, you know, had good costs. And, I grew up in that kind of household. So I, I knew my folks came from the restaurant world, uh, front and back. And when I was 15, 16, around there, when I worked at Swiss LA, I remember I said to my dad, I was like, I need to get a job. And he's like, go serve. Like, you'll be fine. Like, you'll figure it out. Like, it, just go serve. And when I started serving, I was a terrible server. I'm not a good server. Uh, it's not that I can't multitask. It's just that I don't know... Like, if you're an unreasonable guest, I'm not good at letting you be that. Be, yeah. <laughs> like, I'll call you out a little bit. I'll be like, you know, you're being crazy right now, right? Like, you just, I'm not that good of a server. And I knew that I got fired from Jack Astor's when I was a server there. And yeah, it was terrible. But when I started cooking, um, it was one of those things that I was working at a restaurant and I got home and I was like, I don't know, 19, 20 years old, 20. And I was like, okay, like, yeah, I've been doing this a while, but I knew that I wanted to be better than everybody else. That was kind of the thing. I was like, okay, so this is really fun and I'm really, really enjoying it because they always compare kitchens to like pirate ships. Like it's a very, you know, ragtag crew and people from different backgrounds and misfits and that kind of stuff that all end up in these kitchens. Um, and I really loved it and not saying that I was typically one of those people, but like, you know, Dale, like we were in bands and, mm-hmm. and you, know, you needed something that kind of like worked with your schedule. You could kind of get a job anywhere doing it and that kind of thing. But when I started going home and like wanting to chop onions alone, to get better at chopping onions in different ways. And like, I wanted to make sure I could be, I could brunoise perfectly. And I wanted to be able to dice perfectly and julienne perfectly and whatever. I was like, yeah, like this is, this is good. Like I really, really enjoy it. And it was probably when I was in like my twenties, like my early, early twenties, 20, 21. That's when it like hit me that like, I, I think I could, I think I could do this. And then, yeah, once it clicks, it's a really incredible thing because there's different roots in chef world, right? Like a lot of my cooks 
have come from the Montana's Kelsey's background, Mm -hmm. which, hey, man, in terms of like steps and procedures, like that is a really great, you know, thing to learn. But then I get guys and girls that come from independent and I'm not saying one's better than the other, um, but it's, it's one of those things that like, I didn't want to have to climb a corporate ladder. I wanted to be able to want to move on when I wanted to move on. And a lot of people get stuck in those positions because they in corporate restaurants, like, um, like a, a Kelsey's or a Boston pizza, because you're not going to be the chef of Boston pizza. <laughs> yeah. like you're, you're not. And I knew that young. And I was like, I could go get a job at Kelsey's if I wanted to, but I don't know. Like, I just don't see myself being the chef of Kelsey's because that position's filled and the guy or person or girl that is the chef of that restaurant has probably been doing this like 30 years. Like I'm like 30 years out to, to gain that gig. So right. I wanted to kind of move up in independence so I could kind of like have a smaller team and get seen more and be appreciated. And that work gets like, you know, brought up into like, Sue chef positions, junior Sue or whatever. And then like chef to cuisine. And then like, it just kind of worked out that way. And I was very lucky, but it literally all stems from, is someone going to give you a chance? Like that's kind of it. And I got very lucky, uh, many times. And but yeah, in my early twenties, man, like that's when it clicked in that like, yeah, I want to do this. And this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. And uh, it's a great pro- profession because you technically don't need a degree mm-hmm. to be very successful in it. Right. Like you don't, like you can just be just fucking good. I and mean, that's, there's sides of it. Like you have to be a, you have to be a very good cook. Uh, but you also have to be very business oriented. Like at Holt Renfrew, man, like I cooked maybe once a month, twice a month. I never cooked. Was, I had a staff a of 50. Side. Yeah. Yeah. I had an office. It was managing. Like, <laughs> yeah. I had a staff of like 50 people. Like, I didn't have time. I yeah. was overseeing front of house, back of house, the whole department. I had like three meetings a, a day, then phone calls, like all this kind of stuff. And it's, you know, there's there's sides of the coin on both that are that are great and bad. But yeah, it's, you know, it's it's a really funny profession. Like, it's it can be either really lucrative or it can be awful. And I've seen both and yeah. you can be, yeah, you can have a really hard time. Yeah, for sure. And you mentioned a little bit kind of that point where you decided you were going to go for developing your skills. Somebody like me, mm-hmm. who's never worked in a restaurant <laughs> and then, you know, you finish school, you get your own place and you're sending the left your own devices as far as cooking goes. What's like a basic skill that you'd say the average person could work on that would really improve their home cooking? Oh man, nice skills. Yeah. Like work on your nice skills. Yeah. And like, and that's what I used to do. I used to buy bags of onions and just chop. And like, it's not about speed. You see these videos on Instagram, TikTok, like whatever. Like, look how fast I can chop this onion. It gives a shit. Like, it doesn't matter. Like, no one's going to ask you to do that ever. Right. Like, I never. Like, I'm never going to say to my cook, like, Hey man, I need those onions cut in less than 30 seconds. eh? like, I'm never going to say that. I'm just, I need them cut at a reasonable like pace. And I want them done. Like it, but I want them done. Right. Like yeah. it's everyone thinks faster is like better. And then like the sound of like, like that's cool. It's, it's not fucking cool. But it's especially not cool. in home cooking, what does it matter? It doesn't it matter. It takes like, you 20 minutes. Like who cares? Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Like work on, how ingredients work together like and if it grows together it goes together hence why fish and like seaweed are really really tasty together right. and like you know venison and blueberries are really nice and like things like start working on like you know i love eating pasta with peas and lemon and it's like cool that's really great, man. Now, where do you go from there? And like, that's what I would always recommend is like, just always like be interested in exploring. Like if you're a home cook, like have a few things in your arsenal that are knockouts that you can always bang them out and they're always really great. But then like on your own time, like work on your knife skills, like think about how dishes come together and like 
peas and mint, you know, work really, really well together. And then start exploring that. Like, would you typically do rosemary with fish? You can, but like, <laughs> I don't know. Like, I it's not my go-to. And like, start going down that rabbit hole. But it's taking your time and being patient. And it's not a race. It's a marathon. Like, cooking is not, I don't know anything, you know, like about food. Like, I know a lot, but like, I can walk into someone else's kitchen. Like, if I walked into a Japanese kitchen tomorrow, I would be dead. Like, yeah. I'd have no idea. They would, these guys have to wash rice for years before they can even start making sushi in any way, shape, or form. They have to just wash rice. And that's the, the key is like, they have to do something perfectly over and over and over again mm-hmm. before you move into the next thing. So just, you know, take your time, have fun with it. It's, it's food. It's really not that serious. Like, <laughs> and cooking not. is fun. I actually do find when I have the time to cook, I really enjoy it. And I like, like just making a, my own barbecue sauce or making yeah, my right. own rub or something that I want to put. And then like taking my time. I don't like cooking when I'm like, Oh crap, I got to eat by six 30. Cause I got this thing going on at seven and I just got like, mm-hmm. and it's five 30 already. Like, what am I going to do? I don't even have a plan. Like, I don't like that. But right. like yeah, having no hours in the afternoon or evening Man. to just like take your time cooking and then put something nice on the table. Totally. It's, it's really enjoyable. Right. For somebody who's trying to improve or set up a first kitchen, whatever the situation might be, what would you say one of the most important tools they could have in the kitchen? Like, is it a good knife? Uh, mm-hmm. What would you say is like something that's really important to have? Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, I think the spoon is the most important thing to have, like a really good spoon. Um Because you can do so much. Like if you don't have a fish slice or like a fish spatula or whatever you want to call it, you can still turn a piece of fish with a spoon. You can't really with a fork, but with a spoon you can. And like you can turn steaks and you can baste steaks and you can taste. Like a spoon is something I, I always reach for. It's usually in the coats of every cook that's in the kitchen. They always have them on their arm. Or Are you their, talking like a wooden spoon? No, like a metal like, like tablespoon. Your, okay. Yeah. It, they're just so versatile. So that's a huge one. But as a home cook... You need a wooden spoon. I think a wooden spoon is so, so necessary. There's just something about that feel of a wooden spoon. I've had the same wooden spoon, which is probably bad. Like I should probably get rid of it, but like for like eight years, it's, but it's my favorite spoon and I love it. And it's, it just has this hold to it that I love one sharp knife and you're fine. Like right. as a home cook, like you don't need to go spend $300 on a Japanese blade. There's nothing wrong with it. I own Japanese blades and I love them, but I never open my knife bag ever when i'm at home ever i I haven't taken my knife bag to work in years because i have a set of royal dalton gordon ramsay knives i got them as a gift from my wife and they were sharp as shit and they're sturdy i've had them for years and i go for those every single time because if you just buy one really good knife and you keep it sharp and you don't need like to take it to a knife shop or get a stone just get yourself a you know, uh, a sharp like, like a like a steel, yeah, yeah, steel, and just run it across. They last and, a long time, man. It lasts a long time. Like it's like you don't have to do it. Like it's Victoria Knox. It's the same people that you know, the same company that made Swiss Army knives and stuff like that. Like it's a it's a low budget knife. You can get a knife like thirty bucks, but it's going to stay sharp forever. And you need one one chef knife, and you can cut vegetables with it and cut meat with it. You can cut herbs with it. Like, it's all good. But, yeah, sharp knife, a spoon, a spatula, colander. That's a huge one, man. Like, mm. you never, never underestimate, like, a colander or, like, a sieve. Like, those are so, so important. And a spoon, like, that's that's it. Like, but also, I cook very simple food. Like, it's, I love fancy fancy stuff but like when i'm home or whatever it translates into the restaurants as well but things that need less fuss right is what i kind of reach for yeah i like that yeah well we are getting a little bit to the end of uh where we'll be able to uh fit everything into one episode here (laughs) (laughs) but this has been an amazing conversation we got two more questions for you um okay one will be on topic and one is a, a question we ask every guest um, off okay. topic. 
But um, I'll start with the one on topic. If you had just like, I know that this episode was more supposed to be about like simple tips and tricks for you at home. And we did get into that, but we also did talk a lot about the restaurant industry and Mm -hmm. getting into that. Once you enjoy cooking, if do you have any like sage advice for someone who is like, yeah, you know what? I really do like cooking and they want to maybe take their next step and start working in a restaurant or they already do, but like how to get better and like move up in that world. Yeah. Um, work for a chef or a restaurant that you love. Don't just take the first job that comes your way. Like I worked for free at Husk down South. Like it's, you know, there's times when, you know, if you just want to work a couple days a week for free for like maybe three, four hours, if you knock on anyone's door, they'll let you in. Like they'll let you in. Like it's knowledge is the passport in cooking. And it's not about the money. Like the money always comes and everything's fine. But, I would just say if you really want to get your foot in the door um, and you want to start cooking like on a more professional, serious level, like just go work for a restaurant that you love. Like if you order from a place four days a week, there's something about that restaurant that you like. Like go <laughs> work there. Like they're doing stuff that you enjoy. So that's that's one. And then number two is never open up your own restaurant ever. Don't open a restaurant ever, ever, ever. And if you are thinking about it and you're like, yeah, I've made this, like, you know, I'm pretty good at making Don't do it. Like just <laughs> it's so stupid. And we laugh about it all the time because, you know, my bosses like have five restaurants and we're always just like when people talk about open the restaurants, like, really? Hey, you're going to do that, huh? Wow. OK, like, cool. <laughs> like you signed the lease and everything. Oh, huh? cool. Wow. <laughs> like it is not easy. If you can make 10 cents personally on every dollar that you bring into a restaurant, you are doing well. Yeah. And that is not something that I recommend. But, you know, if you're really passionate about it, I never want to deter anyone from being happy so do what you love but work for restaurants that make you happy and that you respect and chefs that you respect but if you're working part-time at a a spot and you're in school and you're just looking for something to do and you want to get more experience just knock on a door they'll let you in for free like yeah man you can work here two days a week and just i'll teach you how to do some stuff like it's really restaurants are cool that way that's awesome I want to yeah. mind asking one more on question, on topic question, Dylan. Go for if that's it. Cool. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for people who are learning about cooking, there's a million websites and probably about that many cookbooks out there with all mm. kinds of stuff. And it can be a little intimidating knowing what to look at. Would you recommend any specific cookbook or some resource for people getting started trying to learn some new recipes? Yeah, definitely. Heritage by Sean Brock is a fantastic book it's it's you know unapologetically southern right uh but it it's so this guy man he is one of the most important chefs of our generation like from saving seeds to you know his influence in southern cuisine and uh you know his relationship to alcohol that is a big thing for cooks and chefs all around the world and his like work on that kind of stuff and mindfulness. And it's a very important book in terms of culinary for chefs He's also his other book. South is also very, very important, but heritage is his first one. And I recommend it beyond belief. I actually have two more. If you are a vegetarian or you want to like, you know, not a vegetarian, but you like vegetables, like you're always kind of stuck uh, on vegetables by um, Jeremy Fox is amazing. He's an incredible chef. He owns like rustic Canyon And I think it's in San Francisco or San Diego, but uh, that's an incredible book. And then if you want a book that like is going to teach you and you need to learn Julia Child's like mastering the art of French cuisine is so (laughs) important. Like she's so important and like, you know, you can't be understated like these legends in the culinary world, like Ina Garden, like super important. Julia Child, like, like these are the books that are around because they're so fucking good at what they do. And um, I can't recommend Sean Brock's books, Jeremy Fox or um, Julia Child. They're all, they're all important. That's great. Thank you. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and our last question we'll ask, this is totally off topic, but it's just kind of our thing that we ask everyone. What have you been watching lately? We're all stuck at home. What on Netflix yeah. on Amazon prime on 
I don't know, Crave TV, what, whatever what, what you got. You <laughs> Sopranos. Sopranos. Oh. <laughs> Sorry from the beginning again. Yeah, I, I, I watched it. I think I watched a lot of it so long ago. And then uh, my wife and I were like, you know, we're going to start this all over again. So we've been binging Sopranos, the Sopranos for the last uh, week or two. And man, that show is just incredible. But yeah, it's usually Sopranos. But if I'm getting trash about it and I do watch trash TV, (laughs) I do love Below Deck. I love those shows so much. And I also love Summer House. Like, I love these shows. I love that drama, man. Like, I love this bullshit. I I love when people argue about who kissed who and all this (laughs) stuff. I love it. Uh, But if I'm getting serious about it, like, yeah, Sopranos. That's that's what I'm watching right now. I've only seen, I think, one or two seasons of that show. And I don't know how I didn't watch more. But it's incredible. Nonstop. How many seasons are there total? There's ten. Yeah, I was thinking I think it's six or nine. seven. It was I, a house. You run. might be right. I, I there's like something. It might be too, eight. It might be eight. <laughs> I I think that the last season two they like have two versions of it, don't they? They oh, like yeah, they do. Season eight A and season eight B, and they're eight like, seasons. All right, cool. Oh no, no, I'm wrong. Six seasons over eight years. Oh, all right. Six seasons. One way to do years. it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I have also been enjoying some trash TV over the past couple months. Yes. Um, and they just had the finale on Friday night, and Dave is going to roll his eyes. But RuPaul's Drag Race. <laughs> uh, RuPaul's Drag Race is amazing. It honestly is it's great. Like so good. I never thought I would be into it's it incredible. when I first heard about it. I was like, this seems silly. This doesn't seem like a me show. But like watching it from – this is the first time I've watched it live and from the beginning yeah. to the end. And just like you get invested in some of these people, and they're so Dude. talented. Like, so down, sashay away. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> kills me every time. RuPaul is, you know, he's not, he's, uh, you know, he's not a drag queen, man. He's the queen of drag. <laughs> Seriously, and just like such a professional and like mm. just an entertainer, business person, like. Yeah, yeah. he's oh, also another great show. Before we end, is um, on Netflix, but it's um, Queer Eye. Oh yeah, dude. Dude, that show is so good. Like, I love that show. Lex, I watch it all the time. But that's another one you can binge because it's just, these guys are just so good at what they do. Like, from design to, you know, to to food, to styling, to wellness. Like, they're just incredible, incredible group of men. Like, it's really good. How about you, Dave? Yeah. What have you been What have you been watching lately? Man, I'm gonna be honest with you guys. It's tough when baseball season starts for me. Ah, <laughs> uh, baseball Huge season. Baseball yeah, I know people like that. Once that gets going, it's uh, my TV watch <laughs> goes down the drain for a little bit. But uh, yeah. so I've been pretty tuned in. <laughs> Good for you, man. Next winter, I'll catch up on everything. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, but thank you so much, Jeff. We really appreciate it. That was some great info, some great tips, and just a great conversation. I think we'll have to get you back to do a barbecue special, though, because that sounds like a sweet idea. Yeah, Yeah, definitely. Thanks so much for having me, guys. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Well, thank you again to Chef Jeff Richards for joining us and sharing just a whole lot of experience when it comes to cooking with all of us. Um, Cooking is an interesting thing because it's something most of us do to varying degrees, but to talk with somebody who uh, who really is their life, uh, you can learn a lot in a very quick amount of time. So it was really great to have Jeff on today sharing all of his tips, tricks, and bits of wisdom about the kitchen with us made me very very hungry (laughs) but uh next week we're moving on to a kind of different thing we've got our friend riley chervenyi on the podcast she's a paralegal with her own firm and she's going to be talking to us about small claims court Uh, she's going to talk to us about the differences between a paralegal and a lawyer when you should use one versus the other differences between small claims court and civil court and what to expect if you get served or if you decide to take someone else to court. As always, you can find us on Google podcasts, Spotify, Apple podcasts, YouTube, and anywhere else you look for your podcast. 
Be sure to give us a follow, a like, and give us a rating on iTunes if you liked it. Stay tuned for upcoming episodes, and we'll see you again at the Grown Ups Table. table.